Well, good morning to everybody. Yeah, you guys say it like we're awake, like we're awake. Good morning. There you go. See, I'm used to working with the kids. So we get up and jump up and down. We have some fun. So if you don't know me, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Uh, I focus mainly in the areas of families and with care. So I get the privilege to work with our kids a lot, down at Forge Kids. We have an amazing team of volunteers who help us down there, serve together. So I love it. I love the opportunity to be up here with you guys as well this morning. So Jeff mentioned we've been in a series called Name Change. The series has been looking at how God changes our name as he changes us. In the very first week, we heard from Matt, and Matt looked at a guy named um, Paul. He looked how Paul's life was changed. I'm sorry, he looked at Abraham. And he said Abraham's name was changed, and God took Abraham and said, I'm going to do something new in you, and I'm going to uh, show you that God loves us. He gives us his name. He gives us a place where we can belong. In spite of our screwed up lives, and in spite of the ways that uh, we mess things up, it sort of reminded me that some of you were here in the early days of Awaken. You remember some of the yard signs we used to put out that we'd let people know that, hey, there's a new church in town. Here's what's going on. Mike had this favorite sign. Now, I thought it was crazy. I said, dude, are you serious? You can put this sign out in the street? But the sign said this. So some of you might already know, know what it's going to say. It said, Awaken Church, we're just a bunch of screwed up people. And Mike, like, he loved that sign. I said, seriously, you're going to put this on the street? He said, yeah. You know what? We got more response of people that sign said, I love that. And you know what? I feel like if I come here, I can be safe. I can be myself. I don't have to be perfect. I, my life can be messed up. It's okay. I can be here. But that was sort of the story of Paul. He was sort of that guy. Then Daniel looked at a guy named Peter. Peter was a guy who was wrapped up in fear, in bondage, and in chains. He was just sort of scared to make that next step. God came along and, and changed his life and changed his name. And he became free to, to love and to serve and to do amazing things through the power of God in his life. It sort of reminds me, I told you I get to work with the kids. And one of the things I like to sort of like pound into the volunteers that work with us, it's this little saying. I say this, we get the privilege of loving and serving Jesus by loving and serving our kids. And Peter would be like the poster child for that. He went from being fearful and being afraid and actually denying Christ on the night of his crucifixion, right? To being somebody who God said, you know what, Peter? Based upon that confession that you said, I'm going to use what you said and build the church. Off that. It's pretty amazing. God changes things like that. Last week, Neil challenged us with Paul. I love the, Neil's message. I love his thought. He said, you know what? God doesn't want us to hide from our stories. God's not, uh, not afraid of our past. And he doesn't want us to be afraid of our past. He's okay with using our brokenness and our messes and making them into something wonderful. Uh, my wife likes to say it this way. She says, God takes our messes and makes them our message. See, I love that. That's the story of Paul. Today, we're just going to land this plane, so we're going to wrap it up, and we're going to be looking at the church. Now, the church isn't just a person. The church is a bunch of people, right? And so we're going to be looking at this name change. Now, God didn't necessarily go and say, hey, nation of Israel, you're going to be my, my program, and I'm going to change your name to the church. No, God sort of just plussed pray, uh, pause in that program, and he started a new one. And during this time, he said, I'm going to start something called the church. He started a new program with the church, and when he's already done with us, he'll press end on that and press resume on Israel, and it goes from there. So we're going to be looking at name change. We're going to be looking at really pictures that we see in the New Testament, pictures in the Bible that help give us an idea, uh, uh, an image of what it means to be really called part of the church. Uh, any of you, maybe you're like me, anybody here sort of uh, maybe been a little embarrassed about your name? Anybody been there, or is it just me? <clears throat> I tell you what, most of you probably don't know my middle name. I see one hand back here, okay. Yeah, many of you probably don't know my middle name because I never say it. My middle name, are you ready for this? My middle name is Rush. Stephen Rush Frittle. It's like, seriously, Mom? Seriously? I don't know anybody who has that name. So I was a kid growing up, right? Everybody else had, like, normal names, but not me. Mine was just, like, this weird name. My, fa my family was into family names. And they thought it was important to give you a family name to sort of remember, you know, people in your past. So my name was Rush. I didn't like it, so I didn't really say it. I just didn't, you know, even today I just write Stephen R., right? I don't spell I just didn't do much with it, you know? 
So I got married. We had kids. We got married young, had kids young. I remember my mom coming to me saying, you're going to name your son. We're going to have a son. You're going to name him Rush. And I said, no way. <laughs> I didn't like it. Well, just make it like his middle name, like Thomas Rush. No, I'm not going to do that to the kid, right? Because I didn't like it. I'm not going to give it to him. It wasn't until a little bit later on when I actually, maybe it's just a guy thing. We don't get it sometimes with some of this stuff. But <clears throat> a little bit later on, my mom was telling me the story. And maybe I probably heard it before, but didn't click. I heard the story of how I got my name. And see, it's sort of a cool story. And once I sort of heard the story, it's like, dude, it's not that bad. I, like, I can live with that. Okay. So <clears throat> my grandpa Frittle was born in 1900. Okay. And when he was born, he was actually born a Rush. His last name was Rush. And so uh, when he was young, probably five years old, six years old, his father died. And back in the day, I mean, there wasn't help for people around. His mom was a single mom, had no husband. He, he was born in a small little town called Franklin, Indiana. Actually, the town I was born in. Okay, small little town, farming, rural community. <clears throat> wasn't much help. So what mom did in those days, they shipped the kid off, sent him to some relatives in another state and left him over there. She went on with life. Uh, <clears throat> she met a, a man, Mr. Frittle, and she got remarried. And when she got remarried, they said, you know, maybe it's time for us to call for our son. So they called my, my grandpa's first name was Burl. Imagine his name, Burl Rush, right? Okay. So they called Burl, my grandfather, up, and they brought him into the family. And all of a sudden, Mr. Frittle adopted my grandfather into the family, gave him a name. He was a kid all by himself, living with relatives in a different state. Now suddenly he had a family. He had brothers and sisters that were part of the family. All of a sudden, he had a community to belong to. He went to a school. Everyone called him one of the Frittle boys. He was just one of the fertile kids that were there. So he, he just had that name. Uh, it ended up that he jumped into a family that was a basketball family. You lived in rural Indiana back in the 1920s. It was basketball, baby. That's what you did, you know. Hoosiers, all that kind of stuff, right? That was them. So they grew up together playing basketball. He actually went to high school. And you, if you're familiar with the movie Hoosiers, my grandfather's storyline sort of follows that movie. There was five, they called them the Franklin Wonder Five. His older brother was on that team. And for three straight years, this small little dinky high school in Franklin, Indiana, went on to win the state basketball championship three years in a row. Then all five of those guys went on to the local college, a big thriving college of 350 people in Franklin called Franklin College. They played there and for two and a half years went undefeated as a basketball team. And it's like, wow, that is pretty cool. So now I'm not quite so embarrassed by my name, right? But the th point is, once I knew it and once I understood my name, then it's like, okay, it's still weird, but it's, I'm okay with it, right? You know, so I get it. I get the story behind it. So today we're going to be looking at the church, you know. Some of us, we just struggle a little bit. How do we all fit into this thing called the church? What's your name? How does it all work together? We're still looking at that. Maybe a couple things to understand first. First, when we say the word church, there's a couple things the church is not. Okay, the church is not a building. It's not brick and mortar, windows, pews, carpets, stage. That's not a church. Actually, it's just a building. It's just a tool. The church, we're going to find out, is us. It's a bunch of people all together. We're going to find out what that is. But the church is not a building. So when we say we're going to church, that's really not true, right? It's like saying the sun rises. We say it. It's not really true. So when we say we're going to church, it's not really it. The church is just a building. When we say that um, uh, it's also not, you know, it's not an event. This isn't church. This is, this is the worship service. One thing I learned, like I have like old habits. One of the habits is I used to say, hey, we're going to church. And Mike, another thing, he likes screwed up people signs. He also likes to give me a hard time about saying we're going to church. He said, this isn't church. He said, this is a worship gathering. As a church gathers to worship, that's what we're doing, not church. So I've learned to change my terminology. You live with your son-in-law long enough, those things happen, right? Other things rub off with aren't so good, but that's one of the good ones, okay? So he taught me, hey, we're coming to a worship, a worship gathering, worship service. This isn't church. The building's not church. The service isn't church. What church actually is, we're going to look at here, what church actually is, the word church comes from uh, a passage it's a, it's a word that was translated from the original Greek. So they found this word. The word, uh, you'll see it up here, is ekklesia. Ekklesia. Ek means out. And lesia talks about a group of people. 
So what the word church actually means is called out ones. Where people who are called out from the world, we're called out from our communities, we're called out from our families, we're called out from where we are, and called to come together at a worship gathering. So the church actually is not a building, it's not an event, or people who are called out ones. In the New Testament, we're going to see that, uh, that God wants to have a relationship with these crazy, crazy people called the church. And that relationship is established through Christ. Look at the first passage here. We're going to look at a passage in Ephesians. And this sort of talks about the word here in, in Ephesians for church is that ecclesia word I was talking about. It says this. It says, and God placed all things under his feet. Now it's talking about Jesus there. He says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him, Jesus, to be head over everything for the church. So there's this idea that we're the, the church and Jesus is the guy who's in charge of all this. It says it's his body, that's one example, and the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So really, so the church is a group of believers, a group of people have a relationship with Jesus. The church actually began, you know, I told you God sort of pressed pause in the nation of Israel and pressed play on this thing called the church. It began in Acts chapter 2, and the very first the church began when the, during the day of Pentecost. And the church age actually goes from then up till sometime in the future. It's been going on for thousands of years. And one day, Jesus, the Bible tells him to come back and grab his church and go up to heaven and throw a big old party and celebrate. And when that happens, the church age sort of ends. Jesus runs the credits on that, and they sort of press his resume on the nation of Israel plan. So during this whole thing from clear over here in Acts chapter 2 all the way up to when Jesus comes back, that's the church. Okay, everybody who's ever lived, who's had a relationship with Jesus, that's the church. So that's sort of the picture. When we talk about that, then we have to realize that we use the word church as a couple different concepts. One of it we call the, the universal church or the big C church, right? That's Acts chapter 2 to when Jesus comes back. That's everybody, every place. But we also have the small C church, and that's us, okay? That's the local church which gathers to worship, not to come to church, but the church that gathers to worship on a Sunday morning. That's the small C church. That's what Awaken is as we gather uh, on a Sunday morning. So we're the local expression of this huge thing that's been going on for centuries called the church. So at Awaken, we don't say we're going to church, right? And why is that? Because why? who's the church? We are, right? We're the church. It's not a building. So we don't say that. We say we're going to, to worship gathering. I'm getting that pounded through my head and changing my lingo, and we can too. You know, uh, some of you guys had a chance to meet uh, Dan Gregory. Dan was here when we did soccer camp. He was, he was leading the team that came up from there. He's been a friend of mine for a, a lot of years. I don't think he'll admit that, but I'll say it. He was my friend for a lot of years, right? But uh, back probably five, six years ago, that church, which was sort of my home church we came from, we had a fire, and the whole worship part of the building burned. And it, big smoke, flames burned down. And I remember he was being interviewed on the evening news that day, and the news reporter was there. Okay, pastor, let me ask you, how do you feel now the church has been destroyed by fire? And Dan just looked at him and said, our church is fine. And the guy's probably thinking, dude, you know, I'm seeing the smoke right there. Your church is not fine. The building is burning. And Dan's like, no, our church is fine. Yeah, yeah, the building burned down. But our church is just fine because we're, that's not the church. We are, right? So this reporter didn't get it when Dan did that. I was like, yeah, that's cool. Listening on, on, the, on the evening news talk about what the church really is. It isn't some building. He didn't get that. And oftentimes we don't get it either. Sometimes we need to hear the stories. We need to see the analogies. We need to see the pictures that help us get it. And that's what we're doing this morning. Maybe uh, we can understand, you know, what does it mean, this whole idea of the church? What does it mean for me? How do I fit in? Uh, what does it look like? How can I have a better understanding of that? And the good thing is we're not alone. The Bible gives us help. It gives us these little metaphors, these little pictures, I like to call them, of the church to help you understand. Because if you're like me, Sometimes it doesn't get through up here, right? But what gets through is a story. What gets through is a picture or an image. It's like, oh, yeah, now I get it. So for people like me, now maybe you guys are pretty smart and you just get it from reading it. I got to see the picture, right? I'm the picture guy. So I see those pictures. Jesus gives us pictures, or the Bible rather gives us pictures of that. 
often the church is pictured in the Bible as a family. So if you're familiar with the Bible, if you've read much of it, or if you've been in the New Testament some, you'll see this concept of family. Family is a big deal. It compares it. We're going to see right here in John uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Here's an idea of picture. If it, yeah, it's going to pop up on the screen here. It says this, Yet to all who receive him, talking about G Jesus, to all who have a relationship with him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. So the Bible tells us that when we start a relationship with Jesus, that a, a transaction happens. Jesus actually changes us from the inside out. We become somebody new. And not only does he change who we are, I go from just Steve, any old guy, to Steve, a child of God. He sort of changes my name to a child of God. Just like my grandfather was brought into the family, they changed his name. He, he got the fertile name. He sort of got a new family at the process. He got brothers and sisters. He got a place to live. He got a community to be in. All those kind of things happen, and he got adopted in to his new family. That's what happens with us. We get a, ch a chance to do that. And in essence, our name is changed to the church. Romans, up here you see it, Romans 8, 15 and 16, says the same thing in sort of a different way. It says, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by this we say, Abba, Father. And the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I said, okay, you know, what's this, what's this all mean? And what's this word Abba? Now, but Abba, it's, it's not a, a Swedish pop group in the 70s, okay? It's, it's not that, okay? This is a word that means something very, very powerful, okay? The word Abba, actually, if you translate that, if you look at what that word means, it means daddy, I mean, I just picture this. I just picture like, here's God just like sitting down on his big old chair and you walk up to him and he just come in. You can start sitting in his lap like daddy. You know, you go sit in daddy's lap. So many times we have this image of God as being this big old judge or being somebody who's very distant. But God says, no, no. When you're part of me and you're part of, uh, and you have a relationship with me, you're part of the family, dude. You get to come in. You get to sit in my lap. You get to talk to me. You get to have this relationship with me that's pretty amazing. It's family. It's being a child. So I love it. The word Abba means daddy. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of relationship. And it's one that reminds us that God desires to have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with us. Since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve, we've been running from that. But God's desire for all of us is that we have that intimate relationship with him. He wants to be our daddy. Well, we can go up and, and have that relationship with him. So I love the idea what that verse brings out. Now, for some of us, you know, maybe your dad was absent or distant or abusive or he abandoned the family. Or maybe your dad was just more concerned with his life and his thing. He didn't have time for you. And if that's your case, man, I'm sorry. I can relate, but I'm sorry. Because that is not how God the Father is. God doesn't want us to say, some of us have amazing earthly families and those are wonderful pictures of god's relationship to us but he's saying this i want you to understand that is not what i'm calling you to i'm calling you to a relationship with jesus himself as daddy who's there to to wrap us up in his loving arms and to be there for us it's it's completely different sometimes in our own family other times it, it might be a little bit the same but let this picture encourage us and let it motivate us and let us change us. I want to ask ourselves a, qu a couple of questions here. If, if this picture is what it literally means, ask yourself this question. You know, we're all related, right? If, we're, if we have a relationship with Jesus, we're all part of the family. We're all together. So I'm your brother or, or you might be my sister. So I want you to do this. Turn to the person, someone around you, and just say, I'm your brother. I'm your sister. Okay, say it loud like you mean it, okay? Now turn to somebody else and say this, say, and you're stuck with me, okay? <laughs> you're stuck with me, that's right, Alana. We are stuck with you, girl. We're stuck with you. But that's it. When we're part of the body of Christ, it, we're brothers and sisters. We're adopted into a new family. We have new brothers and sisters. We have new families around us, which help us understand we're brought in, in, into the family there. Um. So we're related. We all get the chance to love and care for each other. We get to love each other like a family. Maybe not the messed up families we might have come from, but like a really true family that reflects God's love. We get to do that. 
We get to be support and encourage to one another. We got each other's backs. We get the opportunity. Probably the best way that Awaken expresses itself really is not coming up here and hearing amazing music and worshiping together on a Sunday morning. Probably the best way that Awaken expresses itself is through missional communities. And Jeff has a big deal to do that. He spends a lot, of, invests a lot of time in that. Missional communities are where we get to come together as a family, right? We get to come together and not just show up and say, hey, everybody has this nice smiley face on Sunday morning. We get to come, we get to walk into a living room, we sit down in someone's couch, and we share life together. And we talk about the reality of what's going on. And sometimes it ain't very pretty, but we share it. And sometimes it's great, and we share it. But we get a chance to do life together. I want to challenge you that if you're not part of a missional community, maybe check it out, because you won't experience this concept of being part of the family of God unless what? Unless you get into it. Unless you take this step and you say, you know what, I'm going to be a part of this. I'm going I'm to go. I'm going to be part of the family. I'm going to engage in a family, and I'm going to do it. That's what missional communities are all about. It's being on mission in our community with each other and with those maybe who don't know Jesus yet, those in our communities who, are, who really don't have a clue. And we get a chance to be that to them. That's all part of being part of the family. That's why when I say it, like when we talk about our church, I always say this word. This is just me. I always say this is our church family. I don't say parishioners. I don't say congregants or whatever religious term you come up with. Because the reality is, we're a family, right? Whether you like it or not, you're stuck with me. Okay, sorry, dude, you're stuck with me. But we're a family. So I use that term on purpose because it relays the image of what it means to be part of this small C, what it means to be part of this local expression of the church. Another analogy, another metaphor, another picture we see there is one of the body. So the, the, that passage is, is pretty powerful too. We get a picture of the body of Christ in the New Testament. Uh, it's personal, it's a little more intimate than it is just talking about being a family because it's talking about something we all have. Last time I checked, when I look around this room, everybody's got a body, right? Everybody's got one. So we all can pretty much relate to this story. We have a head. If we don't have a head, we're in trouble, right? So we got a head, which sort of directs everything. We have an eyes to see. We have ears to hear. Unless you're like me, my wife says I don't use them enough. And we have a mouth to speak with. Unless you're like me, my wife says I use it too much. Anybody else there? Am I the only one? Nobody else? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Lori. You got stuck with it. I'm the only one who does it too much. So sometimes she said, would you just please shut up? Give me a chance to catch my breath. Right? <laughs> and she means it too. So I've learned to shut up when that happens. I, it took me 30 years to get it, but I finally got it. So, but we all, have, we all have these body parts, and we understand that analogy because you know, we can re- really relate to that. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians 12. There's a couple of verses here. It begins in verse 12. It says this. It says, the body is a unit and made up of many parts. And although all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. So they're trying to say this whole body thing, this whole body analogy, it reminds us, it's supposed to take us right back to Christ in the church. It says, so that there should be no divisions on the body, but that all of its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part rejoices, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. So it's like, Jesus, yeah, I can get that picture. I understand that. It's a body. All these different pieces have to work together. I, don't, I forget what they say. There's like 125 muscles it takes just to smile, right? It takes more to frown. So it's just amazing how much everything has to work together. I'm not the most coordinated guy in the world, but it takes a lot of muscles to work together for coordination. It takes our legs to walk, our arms to pick things up, our mouth to speak. We all have to do that. And the th- thing of it is, in the Bible, it talks about this. It talks about everybody is a part of the body. We all have different gifts, though. Because here's one cool thing. when At the moment that we're saved, God gives us a spiritual gift. He says, I'm giving you a gift that you're supposed to use within the body, just like a special part of the body. Now, here's the deal. Everybody gets a gift, but nobody gets them all. Why do you think nobody gets them all? What would you think? Yeah, exactly. If I had them all, I don't need you. If you get them all, you don't need me. But God designed it in a way that we need each other in order to do this thing called living out the local expression of the body of Christ here together. We need each other. It can't happen without that. We got to come together. We need each other. We're unified. We need one another. We're, We're interdependent on one another. We're unique. We all have different gifts. We have to use those gifts. It won't work properly 
if you don't do your part. Sorry, that's the way it works. God put you here for a reason. And the reason that you're here is so that you can work together locally with this local body and see God do his thing. We need you. You need me. We need each other. And I'm not going to break into my rendition of Barney. Okay, we're good with that. But it's that same concept, okay? We need each other in part of the body. It's a very, very powerful, I think, image of what it means. We've seen that. Some of you know Mike and Bethany Hicks of all are part of our Waken family, now live in, in Texas, in Houston, right where the tornado, I'm sorry, the hurricane came through. And the hurricane came through, and Mike has been chronicling that and put it, chronicling that and put it on as Hurricane Henry came through. We've seen lots of pictures, but what's amazing is here's a city in disaster, and guess what's happened? So many people have come from around the country and just said, hey, it's just me and my boat, but I'm here to help. And they drive down there, they jump in, and they start pulling people out of the water. That, what a great picture of what we're supposed to be doing. Hey, it's just me and my little gift that I got. Just me and my little abilities, what can they amount to? When we all work together, amazing things happen. Lives are touched and things are changed because of that. One last picture we're going to look at, and that's a picture called the bride. Now, some of you, uh, I'm not going to point anybody out, just had a wedding here recently, Faith. Oh, I'm pulling the Philip. I'm sorry. I did it twice. <laughs> Faith just got married. And it was so cool. You know, you think of all the amazing things. So this easy that's right okay he's not imagine okay well we 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 saw the pictures we were there so we saw it so but she just got married so god gives us another picture of what it means to be part of the body of christ that have a bride look at ephesians 5 it says this it says husbands love your wife just as christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing of water through the word and to present her holy and blameless to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle, uh, blemish, but holy and blameless. So he does this analogy. Hey, you, our relationship with Jesus, this name change thing, is sort of like a husband and wife who just got married. That's pretty profound. Matter of fact, it says this. It's a profound mystery. The word there is mega. It's a mega mystery beyond understanding at times. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is a ma an amazing picture of what it, what it means. I mean, it could be um, a little weird if you're a guy trying to figure this out. Women, it makes more sense. It fits in easier. But the idea is this. It, it's God wants to have this personal and intimate relationship with us. As a matter of fact, when God was trying to say, when God created marriage, he said, I'm creating marriage for multiple persons. One of the purposes is so this this connection, this covenant of marriage reflects my relationship with my church. Wow. So every time we do pre-marriage counseling, every time we're talking, talking about marriage, we talk about the idea that marriage is to reflect Christ's relationship to the church. There's an element of sacrifice and love and commitment. There's an, there's an element of love, honor, and respect that all go with that working together. It's incredible the imagery of a bride and what that means to us as a church family. Marriage is a, is a covenant relationship, and that sort of reminds us of the covenant relationship that God has with us. It means that once we begin a relationship with the Lord, that we actually become part of the bride of Christ, have an irreversible and unbreakable bond. I mean, that is really, really cool. Well, let's think about this for a second. Think about this picture of the bride and what that means for us here at Awaken. You know, we're all committed to, te we are committed to each other we will love and serve one another. We're willing to make sacrifice for each other. That's what we do as part of the bride of Christ. We're to be honorable and respectful for each other. Imagine if all of us would treat our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ like that, that new bride on her wedding day. Wow. Wouldn't that be amazing? That's how we're to respond to one another in that way. Uh, it's, it's just so cool the way it works out like that. Uh, we will, and if we actually start doing that, we actually live out the verse that you're going to see up here in John 13. It says this, by this, everyone you'll know, uh, you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So love is the marking factor that demonstrates to us that we are part of the bride of Christ, part of the bride of Christ. So there's a supernatural intimacy that takes place. Um, you might have heard this word, intimacy. Uh, I love this definition. My friend Dan told me this. 
Intimacy sort of means this, into me see, into me see. And there's a sense of intimacy with the husband and wife, right? There's a sense of intimacy as we as the bride of Christ that we are to have with our husband, Jesus himself. And that intimacy happens as part of that. So that picture helps me understand and get a better idea of who I am and how I need to respond to Christ, who is the bridegroom coming back for his bride. So let's wrap this all up. I got a couple of questions for you. I want you to think about this and sort of plug yourself into these questions. When you think about these three little pictures, these three little metaphors you looked at, we looked at the family, we looked at a body of Christ, and we looked at the bride of Christ. When you think about those pictures, what do you think Jesus is trying to tell you this morning about that? What's he trying to tell you about that picture and how you fit in? What's your, what's your heart? What's your gift that he wants you to use for that? How do you need to respond to how he is prodding with your heart right now when it comes to this idea of name change? He's changed your name whether you know it or not. You're part of the family. You're part of the body. You're part of the bride. Ask yourself, what am I doing to deepen and to strengthen my relationship with my Abba Father, my Daddy? What am I doing to encourage that? Am I hanging around? Am I engaging in worship when we gather together for our worship gatherings? Am I interacting with the Lord on my own when I read His Word and I pray and communicate with Him? How am I doing that? He's my Abba. He's my Daddy. Am I talking with Him? What do I need to do to strengthen that relationship so it's more intimate and more deep? What am I doing to strengthen my deepen my relationship with my awakened family. And we're a forever family, guys. If we're believers in Jesus Christ, we are forever family. And we're together. Am I tearing down the walls? We like to build walls to protect our heart. We like to build walls that say, you know what, I'm not going to let anybody into me see because I'm just afraid of how they'll respond. And as part of the body, we begin to tear down those walls we begin to build bridges of intimacy to other people's hearts. That can't happen by myself. It only happens once I'm part of the body, part of the body. Ask yourself, how are you doing that? Are you ready to take that risk to be part of a mission of the community? Take that risk to share your life, to share your um, part of the body together with somebody else. I challenge you that. So as you think about those things, as we get ready to close off here in prayer, we're going to have a couple of stations set up here as a band plays. One of the stations is the cross. Maybe there's something that you need to leave at the cross today. As you think about these analogies, that you know, Lord, yeah, I've sort of been doing the Lone Ranger thing. By the way, that's not really a thing in the Bible. And I just, I need to leave that, man. I, I need to, I need to get into understanding this image of the, this intimate personal relationship you're going to have with me and to follow that. Maybe you want to leave that at the cross. Maybe there's something else you need to leave there. Maybe you're saying, you know what, this whole intimacy thing, this whole thing with Jesus reminds me of communion. And maybe this morning you might say, I'm going to go to the communion station and just say, yeah, Lord, this is me. And I, I'm part of your family. Thank you so much for making part of the family. Thank you for letting me part of the body. Thank you for letting me part of the bride. Help me to understand that in a way that impacts and changes my life on a daily basis. Or maybe there's something that's over here. You say, you know what? There is something that's in my life, and I know it. And it sort of blocks. It's sort of hindering. I can't really go deeper with God. I really can't go deeper with my brothers and sisters in Christ because there's something there it's called sin. And I know what it is. And nobody else knows. It's in my way. You can go there. You can ask for forgiveness. You can write it on a stone symbolically, and you can wash it off, which reminds how God forgives and washes away our sin and can put it away. And not let that hinder what God calls it to. He wants to change our name to the family, to the body, to Christ. Think about that. See how God wants you to respond today as we follow worship.